This morning, just an hour and a half ago, we were studying God's righteous judgment of the world in Jesus Christ, and that is a perfect context for appreciating and enjoying the Lord's Supper. To prepare our hearts for the Supper, I want to give you five reasons to give thanks for the new covenant, which is symbolized in the bread and wine. So what you can do if you're taking notes is write, let us be thankful that, and then I'll give you five things. You don't have to write, let us be thankful that, for each of them. Let us be thankful that, and then I'll give you five points relating to the judgment of the great day and the supper in relation to it, or the covenant that is symbolized by the supper. So the first thing that I want us to remember and to know as we partake of the Lord's Supper is that God forgives our sins through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Let us be thankful that God forgives our sins through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Why is it that believers will be vindicated at the final judgment? If we are equally as guilty, if we are equally as sinful as the rest of the world around us, why should we pass through the judgment without a sentence of condemnation? Should we not be condemned? And of course, the blessed, wonderful news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ on the cross, as a sacrifice, bore the wrath of God and thereby paid the penalty. He paid the price that we owe to God's justice for our sins. We ought to be thankful that God forgives our sins through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And Jesus offered himself up in our place. He offered himself up as a sacrifice. As the priests of the temple and the tabernacle pronounced the sins of the people, over animals, and they sent a goat out of the camp, and they slaughtered a bull and offered its blood on the, the mercy seat. So also, Jesus was sent outside of Jerusalem and offered on the cross to remove our sins from us as a sacrifice. Now, of course, he is both priest and sacrifice, which is a, a wonderful union, and through his sacrifice, through his priesthood, he removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the West. And the Lord has given us the supper, the bread and the wine, to remind us how is it that our sins are forgiven? How is it that we can approach the day of judgment with confidence that we will not be condemned? It is because God has covenanted with us in Christ Jesus that for all those who take refuge in the body and blood of Jesus, his sacrificial death, he will remember their sins no more. And so when, our, when the judgment comes, our sins, which will be brought to light, will not condemn us. We cannot be condemned for them because Jesus was already condemned in our place. As the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 53, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And so we see that Jesus is the one who suffers. He is pierced. He is crushed. He is chastised. He is wounded. And what do we see for us? Peace and healing. And so let us be thankful that God forgives our sins through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. So we do not need to fear the day of wrath and judgment because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, the scriptures say in Romans 8 and verse 1. And the supper assures and reassures us of this, that God's covenant with us in Jesus Christ is to remember our sins no more. Well, secondly, let us be thankful that secondly, God declares us righteous in the perfect work of Jesus Christ. God declares us righteous in the perfect work of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 5, Paul says that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ died for sinners. He goes on and says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, 
much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. What we have obtained now in the present also saves us from the wrath of God in the future. And Paul says in verse 10 of chapter 5, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. It is not just Jesus' death that is beneficial to us. It is also Jesus' life that is beneficial to us. His death cleanses us from our sins and saves us, and his life is given to us. His obedience is attributed to us. Later in the same chapter, in verse 19, Paul says, As by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, Adam sins, those whom he represents are made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. It is not just Jesus' death that cleanses us from our sin, but it is his obedience that makes us righteous. God declares us righteous in the perfect work of Of Jesus Christ. And when we think about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ or the fact that he is a priest, and we think about his priesthood, we ought to remember that the scriptures tell us that he was a perfect priest. He didn't need to offer a sacrifice for himself first, as though he had some kind of sins that needed to be atoned for in order for him to be pure enough to offer a sacrifice on our behalf. Nor did he have to purify himself as though he were a sacrifice. You know that the the animals that were were sacrificed had to be unblemished. Well, Jesus is perfect priest and perfect sacrifice who lived a perfect life. His innocence, his perfection, his holiness, all of these things make his sacrificial death and his victorious obedient life what give to us the fullness of our salvation. If we, if we subjected Jesus Christ and his life to the judgment of God, to the judgment seat of God, his deeds and his words and his thoughts and his intentions and his desires would all pass with a perfect score at every point in his entire life. Not one of us can even fathom what that is like. But that's why we give thanks to God. That's why we praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for his goodness, his righteousness, his holiness, Because it's given to us. We are clothed. We are robed with his righteousness because his obedience is attributed to us. So on that day of judgment, God will accept us. We will pass through that judgment not only because our sins are forgiven through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, but also because we are robed and clothed with Christ's obedience attributed to us. And those robes are unmarred, unsullied. They are perfect. They are bright. They are white. They are Christ's. We could stop right there and enjoy the Lord's Supper. But there's much more to say. Thirdly, let us be thankful that, number three, God accepts us, then he accepts our works. God accepts us, then our works. The new covenant which God has made with us in Christ gives us forgiveness. His covenant with us is to remember our sins no more. God's covenant with us in Jesus Christ gives us Christ's obedience. By his wounds we are healed Through the death of the one, the many are made righteous, Isaiah 53 and Romans 5 teach us. So the new covenant gives to us justification, this forgiveness and this obedience granted to us freely in Christ. But the new covenant does more than that. The new covenant, having made us acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, also makes our good works acceptable to God in and through Jesus Christ. God accepts us in the Son. And he therefore accepts our good works through the Son. For example, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, he says this, We offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What does it mean to offer a spiritual sacrifice to God? We're not talking about killing animals. We're talking about offering. We're talking about dedicating. We're talking about setting something apart for God. 
And he says, we offer spiritual sacrifices. We dedicate ourselves. We purify ourselves. We serve God. And Peter says that our spiritual sacrifice is acceptable to God. God accepts my service to him. God accepts my good works performed towards him. And Peter says, yes, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This means that God accepts our sincere but imperfect good works, good works in Christ Jesus. We obey him, but we don't obey him perfectly. But because of the new covenant, those good works are purified and cleansed and acceptable. They please our Father. He does not reject our good works for their imperfection because they go through Jesus Christ. If God rejected our works for their imperfection, he would never hear our prayers. And so just as God hears our prayers through Jesus Christ, Christ, he also accepts our good works through Jesus Christ. He accepts us first in the Beloved, and then he accepts our good works in the Beloved as well. So when we obey, obey God sincerely, albeit imperfectly, our good works are acceptable to God. And as a, a small aside, this is one of the fundamental differences between what is known as a covenant of works and a covenant of grace. In a covenant of works, God says, you must obey these laws, you must obey these commandments, and so long as you do, or if you do, you will receive the reward. So your acceptableness depends on your obedience. And so far as you obey, you are acceptable. Adam in the, in the Garden of Eden, he disobeyed, no longer is acceptable. He's expelled from the sanctuary that God had made for him in Eden. Israel in the land of Canaan, they disobey God. They pollute the land with their idolatry. They become unacceptable to God and therefore lose the blessings that he had given to them through the Mosaic and Abrahamic covenants. Well, is that the way that God deals with us, his people in Christ? Does he say, okay, I've given you Christ. I've brought you in. Now, you need to remain acceptable through your works. Your works need to keep you qualified and acceptable in order for you to remain in this covenant. No, that is not the way that he deals with us. He accepts us in Christ, forgiving our sins and counting us righteous in Jesus Christ. And then he accepts our good works as perfect in Christ Jesus. We should be thankful that the Lord does not bring us into the land and tell us to stay there by our own obedience. Rather, the Lord provides all things for us in the covenant. We are his children, and our good works are pleasing in his sight in Christ Jesus. And the supper reminds us that we are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, and therefore our service, our spiritual sacrifice, Sacrifice, our worship, our good works are likewise acceptable to God. It's a common thing, maybe more in men than women, to be afraid of doing something for fear of failure. It affects everybody. I don't want to do it because I don't know if I could handle the rejection or the failure or the possibility of not doing it right and the criticism that comes from such things. Do, never be that way with God. Never be that way with your Heavenly Father. I will, I will worship him, I will serve him, I will live for him, and he will accept me. He will accept my good works as a loving and gracious Heavenly Father because before we ever get to my good works, Jesus Christ's sacrificial death has cleansed me from my sin, and Jesus Christ's perfect life has robed me in his perfection and righteousness. The supper reminds us of these things. Number four, fourthly, let us be thankful that God rewards our works graciously. God rewards our works graciously. Let me explain what I mean by this. And this is one of the key tie-ins to the sermon this morning. Because the judgment day will bring to light our good works. The judgment day not only brings sin to light, it also brings good works to light. It brings hypocritical good works to light, formalism to light, which is not true good works, but it brings true good works of God's children to light. And that is part of what vindicates us. That is part of what proves us to be God's children. 
There are so many passages that we read this morning that say things about being judged by our deeds, being judged by what we have done. And you may think, didn't we kind of skip over that point this morning? A little bit, yes, because here we need to understand that our good works are made acceptable to God in Christ Jesus and that they will shine brightly on that day. Our good works will vindicate us as a further confirmation of the genuineness of our faith. Our adoption will be made evident by our good works. And the scriptures teach this in places such as Matthew chapter 25, where there are some who, don't even, who didn't even realize that they were doing good works, not that they weren't trying to, but they say, they essentially ask, when did we do these things for you, Lord? When did we do these things that you are praising us for or that you are commending us for? And Jesus says, as they did it to the least of their brethren, they did it to me. Or as you did it to the least of your brethren, you did it to me. So there will be people on that day to whom the Lord says, you did well. You did good things for me. As you did good things for my people, as you did good things for my children, you, your good works shine on this day. So too, our good works will vindicate us on the day of judgment. They will not be the reason why we are allowed into the new creation. They will not be the thing that tips some kind of good works versus bad works balance in our favor. Okay, you have enough good works, you're in. No, that's not the way that it works. And yet our good works will be evidence of the genuineness of our adoption. Now, I said the name of this, the title of this point is that God rewards our works graciously. So first of all, we're noting that our good works will be evident on that day. But Jesus also in Matthew 25 teaches the parable of the talents. And we read that to those who were faithful with what God had entrusted them, God says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now, this is this is a judgment event where a person's faithfulness is recognized, is commended, and is rewarded as that person enters into the joy of their master. We're not talking about rewards here on earth. We're talking about rewards in the day of judgment. It's not a topic that is often discussed in at least in our circles that I'm aware of, it's sometimes hard to judge that. But yes, there is reason to say from the scriptures that the Lord will reward our good works. The writer to the Hebrews we read in chapter 6 this morning said, God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints. The writer to the Hebrews says, you have served God's people. God will see this. And God, he says, God is not unjust so as to overlook your work. He's saying God takes note of this. God sees it. And the parable of the talent says God rewards this. He rewards faithfulness. But what we need to understand is that God rewards our good works graciously. What I mean by that is that God will not reward our works because our works are just so good that he has to reward them. He does not reward our works because of any inherent value in the works themselves. It is not that the things we do somehow merit or accumulate debt on God's part towards us. God does not owe us something because we have served him. Rather, Jesus also teaches us that when we have done our duty, what are we to say? All we have done is our duty. We are unprofitable servants. So this means that if we serve the Lord our God, and he chooses to reward us, it is gracious. It is simply because he is so merciful and so gracious that he would choose to reward our works, not because the works themselves have any intrinsic value or merit. The reward is of grace. The reward is disproportionately large to the work. We earn nothing by our good works. And yet the Lord is so gracious that he chooses to reward them. Such is God's mercy and grace to us. If you doubt God's mercy and grace, 
look at the bread and the wine. (laughs) Is he not a God of mercy and grace? Is he not a God who delights to shower blessings upon his children? And so we should be encouraged that the service that we render unto the brethren, the things that we do in service for God, our spiritual sacrifice, God is not unjust so as to overlook such things, but rather he will reward our faithfulness as we enter into the joy of our master. A particular Baptist named Nehemiah Cox said this. He said, God will graciously reward the good works of believers, so that besides that joy and glory that all saints have an immediate right to, by virtue of their interest in Christ, everyone shall receive a superadded crown, according as his work shall be, which lays a foundation for our believing the enjoyment of different degrees of glory among the blessed in another world. So what he's saying here is that because God graciously rewards our good works, there's reason to think that in, in the new creation there will be degrees of glory, degrees of commendation. Yes, there's a, a common joy and a common glory that all saints will have, no question whatsoever. And yet, in the parable of the talents, the one who is faithful over a certain amount is given a certain amount. And the other who is faithful over a larger amount is given a larger amount. Enter into the joy of your master. And so if you ask me to explain exactly how that works, I can't tell you that. But I can tell you that the scriptures declare that God graciously rewards our works. And that these rewards are reserved for that day of judgment. We will all know the joy of sinlessness, the joy of perfection, the joy of glory the joy of being with Christ, but some will receive a reward for their works in various in varying degrees. And yet, all those rewards, because they are of grace, all the glory is still given to Jesus Christ. There's, there can be no boasting in the new creation. There can be no pride in the new creation. There's no, look, I was better than you, or anything like that, because it was all of grace. The reason that that person was faithful was of God's grace. The reason that God rewarded their faithfulness was of God's grace. And so by saying that that believers' good works are rewarded in varying degrees is not in any way to establish or legitimize pride on the part of man. Rather, it is simply to acknowledge the magnitude of God's mercy and grace to his children here and hereafter. So in the day of judgment, our sins that are brought to light are forgiven. Christ's righteousness is what robes us. Our good works will be manifested, will be shown, will become evident, and God will reward those good works, all because of his covenant with us in Christ Jesus. Fifthly and lastly, let us be thankful that God provides reconciliation. The beginning of salvation is glorious. God forgives our sins. He counts us righteous in Christ. The end of salvation is glorious. We are vindicated as his children. We are rewarded in Christ. The in-between is hard, isn't it? The in-between is difficult. We sin. But our sin does not negate or nullify the beginning or the end. Because God preserves his people. And one of the ways in which he does that is through his covenant, which provides infinite mercy and reconciliation. When we sin, we go to him and we confess our sin, and we know through the body and blood of Jesus Christ, through his sacrificial death, we are forgiven. When we stray, we return to the same covenant, the same promise of forgiveness, and we renew and refresh our communion with God. You'll never go to the covenant and, and see it saying, sorry, the covenant's closed for today. Sorry, the covenant's all out of forgiveness for today. No, we keep coming back to an infinite reservoir of God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. And so God has provided forgiving our sins, reconciling us to himself to begin, and all along the way, all the way up until the very end. And through the covenant, through the Lord's Supper, through repentance, and through restoration, we return to God and renew and refresh our communion with God. Because God has given us a well to drink from along the way. And that well 
is the new covenant in the blood of Christ, which we celebrate in the Lord's Supper. In the Supper, we find a regular reconciliation, a regular forgiveness, a regular refreshment, a regular renewal. Those who cling to the covenant and to the Christ of the covenant, they show themselves to be God's true children. Let us give thanks, brethren, for the new covenant. It is how God saves us from the wrath to come. The new covenant is the agreement, the contract, the fine details of why we will be spared on that great day and why God would ever look at our works and accept them and why God would ever look at our good works and reward them. How can it be that I should survive this judgment and pass through it actually commended and rewarded when I finally see the full magnitude of my sin on that day? Oh, brothers and sisters, we will glorify God forever and ever and ever when we see how much we deserved by way of condemnation. And then we see that we live in rewards of good works purified and perfected by Jesus Christ. Oh, what a wonderful blessing the Lord has given us in the new covenant. And, and to try and connect all the dots in conclusion, remember what we proclaim every time we partake of the Lord's Supper. We proclaim his death, how long? Until he comes. What is your hope for passing through the day of judgment? Jesus tells us, he says, regularly, 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 Proclaim my name, proclaim my death until I come, because when I come, I come in judgment. And it will be then, just as now, that my body and blood are the foundation for your passing through that judgment. If we are clinging to Christ and the covenant now and all along the way, when Christ comes and comes in judgment, everything continues, everything proceeds onward. We finally receive the one whose death we have been proclaiming. We finally meet with the one whose symbols we have enjoyed for all our lives. The covenant is what feeds us. The covenant is what sustains us. The covenant is what reconciles us to God along the way. When Christ comes, those who ate his body and drank his blood, those who communed with him on earth, they will be with him in glory forever. If you partake of this supper in faith, if you embrace Jesus Christ by faith, Believing and trusting in his sacrificial death and his perfect life, you know that you will pass through that judgment. And you know that because of his sacrificial life and perfect, his sacrificial death and perfect life. If you are a member of the new covenant, a believer in Christ, if you come to this table and eat and drink in faith, you can be assured you will pass through God's judgment in Christ. That day of judgment will be a day of salvation for you. Because God forgives our sins through the sacrificial death of Christ. He declares us righteous in the perfect work of Jesus Christ. He accepts us and then our works in Jesus Christ. God rewards our works graciously in Jesus Christ. And God provides reconciliation in Jesus Christ until the very end. Amen.